Women in Leadership brought to you by Heron Code, the management consultancy for what happens next. For more information, you can visit heroncode.com. Welcome back to another episode of the Heron Code Women in Leadership podcast. We've had a great season so far, and I keep saying this in every introduction of every episode, but it really does get better and better. Today, I'm joined by Hawaza Nasif, who is helping to turn environmental and social responsibility into a priority for businesses across the country. And one thing that really stood out for me was that you've also received a Global Impact Award for your uh, work as well. And this was in particular a women's shelter in Saudi Arabia. Welcome to the Heron Code podcast. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. And yeah. thank you for having me here. Absolutely. I'm very to thrilled, do this. thrilled to have this conversation with you because, you know, I think it's so it's so funny. We all sit now in the present and we're like, oh, and all these years later, now we're here, you know, uh, but so much has happened. And I want to break that down because I think your story is inspiring. And, you know, young girls or even adults listening could learn a lot from you today. So, It's been quite interesting. I want to take you back to maybe early days of education, family. Where were you raised? What was what was kind of the vibe when you were younger? What were you dreaming to become? I grew up in Saudi, born and raised in Saudi Arabia uh, in the 80s, actually. Mm. One of the, I would say, more interesting times for women in Saudi. I I grew up, you know, without uh, being told that we have many opportunities in the market. I remember as a student in school, we used to be taught how to make a home, how to saw, how to like, you know, do like housekeeping stuff. Mm -hmm. Rather, when the boys were getting economics and other types of uh, lessons that would help them become better employees, I guess, or or entrepreneurs. And so from there to to seeing where we are today is fascinating for me Mm -hmm. because in in just uh, a span of... 30 years, the progress that women have made also in education. Like today, women can become lawyers, engineers. There's a co-ed school uh, in Saudi, a co-ed university as well. Mm. So it's just fascinating. Mm. Like when I look, I sometimes just look back and I'm like, who would have thought? Yeah. So were you you able to dream then as a young girl? I always dreamt. I Mm. always, I never took no for an answer. I think that's one of the things that um, made me not care about my surroundings. I, I always believed in chartering your own path, regardless of what people tell you you can or cannot do, regardless of what the environment allows you to do. You just put something in your mind and, and you go and do it. That's, mm. that's my philosophy always. So I always knew I wanted to do something bigger than what I was told I could or should and so when I graduated high school, I insisted on leaving Saudi to study engineering because that's what I wanted to study at the time. Mm. And uh, it wasn't an option in Saudi. And so that took a lot of convincing within mm. my family. I was the first girl in the family to leave Saudi and study abroad. And I was alone, so it was a big deal. Wow. Yeah, but I managed to convince my parents and, and I went and I did study engineering for three years but mm. then I I decided it wasn't what I wanted to do and I studied something else so one of the things that I also tell younger people today is it's okay to take time to figure things out it's okay if you don't know right away what you want to be or you know what your path is going to look like mm-hmm. um, as long as you're continuously developing yourself investing in yourself learning working as long as you don't stop like you mm. keep going then it all in the end comes together somehow. Mm. So when I look back at my education years, my education in engineering helped me today with the way I think, with the way I structure my problem solving, you know, mm. um, how I solve problems and how I approach things. It's, it's a very well-structured manner, which I, I credit to my years in engineering Mm, I I completely agree I think there's this misconception also that you know kids look at us and think we've got it all together I feel like I'm 32 years old and I'm still figuring out what I want to do with my life and we're always learning we're always trying to strive for better and so I felt it was really important for me to have role models growing up was that something that you were able to have or did that especially in the field that you potentially wanted to go in or did that only happen when you went into um higher education when you moved abroad? I can't say that I had 
female role models mm-hmm. a, not a lot mm-hmm. i had um strong women in the family they weren't working mm-hmm. but they were strong and ambitious and um you know they weren't the type of women that would allow uh society or or others to tell them what to do and so uh, that was always an inspiring thing um mm-hmm. which all, i guess allowed me to always think that i don't need to conform i don't need to just listen to others i can do what i want to do mm-hmm. and that's okay mm-hmm. and so in that sense yes uh but it was hard to find role models in the workplace because there weren't many uh one of the very few that i always adored and i i continue to find her the most amazing fascinating saudi woman is uh, miss lubna alayan mm-hmm. who i ended up working for at some point um yeah so that was one of the highlights of my career wow it's like a full circle moment exactly. isn't it so take me to your higher education so you moved from saudi arabia you're on your own you're away from your family you're breaking the mold was there a pressure to make it to go back home with something of course mm. yeah yeah of course i mean there was a lot of pressure i was i have i'm a I'm one of five sisters, uh five uh, girls in the family and so I was the first one to actually leave and study abroad. So there was a lot of pressure internally uh mm-hmm. for me to succeed because if I did then my other sisters probably would also travel and if I didn't they won't mm-hmm. probably. So I was kind of the example of whether this could work or not and Thank God I was able to get into the schools that I wanted. I was able to, you know, get the degrees that I had in mind and and it all worked out. Mm. And then uh, my other sisters, four of them all went to school in the US as well and graduated from all different universities. And so I Amazing. always joke with them and tell them this was due to me. Yeah. <laughs> you have me to thank for all of yeah. your successes. I, I, I did that. the the convincing. <laughs> yeah. You decided it easy. You you're a trailblazer for for your generation. Uh, and so how was that because you were experiencing a brand new culture at this point, you know, you're immersed in this new new country which where did you travel to to uh to study? Yes. Uh, I was in Boston, US. Okay. Yeah. Okay, definitely a completely different culture yeah. to Saudi Arabia. How did you kind of adjust and 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 merge yourself into it? It was it was interesting at first. It was different obviously. Um I also I experienced 9/11 in the US, mm. so it happened on my second year. So the and obviously being a Saudi that was a a very um difficult period, but it also taught me about um you know trust, resilience, uh you know dealing with difficult times and dealing with fear also, you know mm. there was a lot of fear um at the time, a lot of unknowns, but I decided my dad I remember at the time called me and said, "Look, if you want to come back to Saudi you can mm. uh you can just you know leave school and come back and I said no I'll, I'll stay mm. and most of my friends went back at that time because they were afraid and so I stayed and you know just I guess made me stronger mm. and and it was interesting to see um you know islamophobia racism a lot of um bad press against my country and my people mm. but also being able to counter that with you know being who i am talking about who we are as muslims and and saudis and mm. and it was a very active time mm. in in the states educating educating people yeah. to actually know the truth i think it was important as well during that time so you've done higher education what was the goal after that i feel like our goal posts are constantly changing so you've graduated then what was next for you so i graduated um university i went back to saudi there weren't many opportunities for women at that point uh to work so i decided to move uh, outside of saudi i worked in dubai um and then i ended up going back to school uh i did a master in law mm-hmm. uh and from there on um i got into sustainability because that's when i studied about corporate governance and how boards uh manage sustainability the sustainability performance of companies and so i got really interested at the time it was being called csr mm-hmm. and so i i not many companies in saudi even knew what csr is and or were let, let alone doing it so mm. I got back to Saudi in 2009 I believe and um and from then on I started really focusing on uh, on 
doing corporate sustainability. Mm. And so eventually I I worked with um, Orléans Finance and Company, uh, heading their uh, or setting up their corporate social responsibility program across the group. And so that was a, a fascinating experience because it allowed me to work in so many industries with so many companies, including Coca-Cola, Burger King, Colgate, Palmolive, so many international brands and also local companies that are, you know, trying to do it in a in a way that fits um, their local context. And so that experience helped me to understand that you ca- have to customize your approach uh, to sustainability. You can't just design a one size fits all approach and expect it to work. Mm. And so that was good. And what's interesting here, though, is that not only are you basically laying the foundation for a brand new concept or process within businesses, but you're also a woman doing it. So how was that experience? Was your voice being heard as much as you thought it was? Were you even noticing because you were just so tunnel vision on a mission to get things done? How was that experience for you? It was interesting at the time because this is, again, um, many years back Mm. uh, and so um, there were obviously many women in the workplace at that time but we were struggling to find our place and struggling to be accepted and and also to be taken seriously and so I had to deal with a lot of um, a lot of situations where I couldn't just rely on my education I had to rely a lot on my social IQ Mm. to navigate you know how to get what I want done uh, while dealing with people that sometimes didn't want me in, in, in that place or, or didn't accept or didn't think I should behave or talk or, or dress a certain way. You know, people have their own opinions about w- what women should or shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And so that got reflected a lot in the workplace. And so it, ha- it was always a balance to me uh, trying to understand how do I get what I want done Mm -hmm. to meet my targets and the things I want to do for my function, dealing with all different mentalities and and stereotypes, and I guess people, people's stereotypes of women. Because it's, it's interesting, isn't it? You have to be quite diplomatic. And a, a lot of women that I've spoken to on this podcast have said they've had to not stop their voice, but they felt like they had to change their voice. And this is where they say women are a lot more switched on because mm-hmm. they know how to get what they want to get. Mm-hmm. There's just a way of doing it. So but, how do, what do you think? Changing your voice? Is that what you had to I mean, do? Absolutely. Uh, women are more uh, diplomatic and, and switched on in the way they do things. And uh, it's a survival skill mm-hmm. in a way. You um, And for me, it, it felt always, for the longest time, it felt like I had to navigate a lot. Um, not just do my work, but deal with a lot of side issues. Mm. And so I had to develop that muscle. Um, as well, like in every other country in the world, um, women have to deal with, you know, things that men don't deal with. Like if you're, if you're assertive, then as a woman, you're aggressive. As a man, you're a leader. If you're, if you're nice, uh, as a woman, you're too feminine and weak Mm -hmm. but as a man you're empathetic and Mm. and just a lovely boss yeah and so you had to always there are these um i don't know i I think they call them like double bind something Mm -hmm. i'm not sure of the term now but it's like we cannot in a way i felt i feel like we cannot be like men and be perceived the same Mm -hmm. We can do the same things and say the same things in the same way, Mm -hmm. but the perception of us is different. Mm. So unless you realize that early on and be able to be assertive, be it not too aggressive, like and and maintain your femininity as well, because Mm. there was a point where I was I saw that a lot of the women in the leading uh, businesses were acting more like men in the way they dress and the way they uh, behave. And it was almost, to me, it felt like you had to do that Mm. to be taken seriously. Mm. And one of the things I I really value today is, no, I can be a woman. I can be feminine. I can be all these things. And yet I'm effective and strong and I'm a leader as well. You Mm. You don't need to be like a man to to be successful. Yeah. And to get the same results even or even better results. Exactly. Um, 
so what's interesting here, though, is that, you know, introducing a brand new concept idea to a country that has really not taken it on. The other parts of the world had. Uh, how was it received when you initially went into these businesses and started speaking to people about about this? Was it kind of unheard of? Was it a lot of rejections of, no, we're not interested? Uh, how, how was that process for you? It's amazing how times have changed. I remember when I first started working in this space uh, I was often told that um, me and my team or my department were a cost center so whenever the business was doing well it was great to have because it was good marketing and good you know um, way to to get more uh, customers and but when the market was bad we were the first ones to go because Mm -hmm. we weren't essential to the Mm -hmm. business and so these times are far gone like Mm -hmm. today businesses are seeking sustainability experts uh, to help them not only navigate uh, the new world that we're living in, but also to reduce uh, um, risk and, and to create value for the businesses. So now there's this this real genuine understanding that this is essential. This mm-hmm. is not something that you do for marketing or PR or whatever. No, it's actually essential. It helps businesses stay uh, continue to exist. It helps them reduce cost, uh, avoid um, you know reputational damage, litigation, fines, so many things, and also it it keeps them relevant today. Society does not accept what it used to accept in the past in terms of the way the businesses impact uh, the environments, the way businesses impact communities, and and so on. So, responsible businesses are becoming the norm. Mm. If you're not that's not acceptable anymore Mm. and so I think um, it's amazing where in the past I always had this constant need to convince the business that we were relevant Mm. to what they were were doing that we were creating value Mm. today that you don't need to do that you Mm. just need to create that value and um, and people there's a lot of more support today that for so if I I look at the GCC in general in the UAE Saudi Arabia um, to a lesser extent in, in some of the other countries, but there's there's a huge push towards um, environmental responsibility, towards uh, you know making businesses more responsible, and so um, you know with the net zero commitments of the countries and COP28 just mm-hmm. around the corner for the second year in the region. Uh, it was in Egypt last year. That's that's galvanizing communities. That's leading a lot of businesses to ask questions about what is this? What do I need to do? Mm-hmm. I want to be, um, you know, I want to be like other businesses. I, I don't want to be left out. Uh, and so I don't want to be perceived as not as uh, responsible or good. So mm-hmm. it's it's been f- a fascinating five years, I would say, mm. um, since this whole space completely was revolutionized yeah it's definitely shifted and what i find really interesting is how do you ever can you ever tell which businesses are doing it for the right reasons and not because i feel like a lot of the time some businesses or even you know restaurants claim to you know be green and eco-friendly just to have the tag on you know just to have that green tick so to say just for marketing purposes just for perception but the intentions and the the roots and the foundations of a business to actually have that in would be way more important. Can you can you kind of see through it? <laughs> I'm an optimist in general, okay. <laughs> uh, and having been uh, having been in this space for so long, I'd say just the fact that businesses want to brag about being green to me is positive mm-hmm, because true. there was a time when. People didn't want to even hear about it. Like mm. they thought we were the crazy ones, you know, mm. talking nonsense. Yeah. And so I I am more sympathetic towards businesses that want to do good, but mm. perhaps don't know how. And f- through my work with so many businesses, a lot of times it's not done because of bad intentions. They really do think that, I don't know, um, recycling is enough or it makes them green. Or mm. it's, it's not often like uh, there's not always malintention or you know I always have a bit more uh, compassion or or Mm. like um, you know understanding towards businesses that want to do one and I'm I I was approached it saying okay that's great I love that you're doing this I love that you're committed to whatever it is even if it is in a way marketing Mm -hmm. but here's how we we go to the next level now this is great 
let's do more. Let's mm. be more impactful. Let's focus on the things that actually matter mm. within your business. Within so let's look at what's material to you. And mm. and and once you start explaining those things to businesses, usually they say, oh, you know, we never thought about this. That's great. How do we do it? Mm. Rarely do I meet businesses that say we know this, but we just want to greenwash. Yeah. It's, okay. I, I have not come across that mm. yet. So I'm. Um, I'm, I'm not a big, um, I think th- there's a lot of good intention. Yeah. But sometimes people just don't know how or what to do to, to be better. Mm. And we have to understand this whole space is evolving. You know, uh, what you think you knew three months ago, unless you're keeping yourself up to date with mm-hmm. what's happening, it's probably outdated. Yeah. So one of the challenges of being a leader in that space is continuously keeping yourself up abreast of you know what's happening Mm. you know what is being said what are the new uh terms the new arguments criticism that's coming into the space all the time i have uh more sympathy towards businesses Mm. i enjoy helping them get to where they want to get Mm -hmm. and and be better Mm -hmm. and showing them how that's done yeah um yeah, I, I don't uh, judge too much. Yeah, it helps shift the mindset and maybe even change their personal lives at home and just exactly. change everything together. And that's what I wanted to touch on because, I mean, I guess you came into this field, I wouldn't say late in life, but it was out of education. And when you went back to Saudi Arabia, how do we ensure kids learn about this from a much younger age? Yeah. Because then these things can be more impactful from young, for younger generations. That's absolutely true. I think um, I was blessed uh, as a child because I had a friend who from, I believe, third or fourth grade was obsessed with the environment. Oh. And we, were, we, at the time, didn't understand what she was talking about. And uh, she would recycle things at home I, I remember her father helped her get like some technologies or equipment to recycle paper and she would she even convinced the school to have like an after school like environmentally focused um, uh, sessions and and uh, it kind of got me intrigued we were children but mm. she was way ahead of her time wow um and so uh her name is Jawahar Asteri <laughs> <laughs> I want to give her credit for that yeah um and so she she always got us thinking about those things and actually one of my uh one of my uncles was also heading the uh environmental I believe it was called environmental agency at the time in the 80s and so it was a it was a small office I guess or a small entity at the time under the Ministry of Defense Um, and he uh, he used to always talk to me about uh, ecosystems and nature and and pollution and and this is in the 80s and early 90s where no one you know was talking about these things at least not in my region and so his name is uh, Abdel Bar Al-Gain and he passed away many years ago um, but he also influenced the way I, I viewed these things. And so I guess I was in a way blessed that I, even though I didn't have any formal education, but I had people around me that kind of opened my eyes. Um, but I, I think it's essential to have uh, environmental education in schools, um, also for parents today to set a good example for their kids, um, not littering. That's one of the big things that I think people need to start really instilling i still see people sometimes unfortunately throw things out of their Mm -hmm. cars or or like you go to a place that should be like a nice tourist destination and it's full of litter and i think that's one of the areas that i would like to see um done well so segregating waste recycling waste putting things where they should so that we can reuse them Mm -hmm. um that's one of the more visible things that people can start doing and then I'm also I like um, I like these campaigns to clean sometimes like cleaning beaches cleaning Mm. deserts clean because it teaches kids that waste shouldn't be there Mm -hmm. and so that's that's good Um, but you know there's uh, today there's so much focus on environmental degradation for one Mm -hmm. and also on social issues and social equality and equity and and um, and so the media is playing a good role and being in a global world also helps 
because you know you can get your information from anywhere mm. we didn't have internet in the 80s at least in Saudi yeah. so you couldn't actually uh, seek that uh, mm. education or, or awareness and so today it's it's a much easier um, it's much easier to I guess learn and, and keep yourself up to date on what's best practice in different areas but I, I think education in schools and parents mm-hmm. these are the most important uh, elements mm, and this has all really been a part of uh, the kingdom's vision 2030 i mean there has been such a push uh, on this vision can you tell us more about the roadmap you know uh, the the net zero by 2060 um how how heavily are you behind it and you know is it all going to be achievable of course it's going to be achievable <laughs> we're committed i mean there's no It's amazing what's happening in Saudi. I really just find it so fascinating Mm -hmm. because there's just so much happening at the same time, so much energy, so many things changing and moving. And even I'm someone who, this is my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. I do this every day. Uh, I look at the news. I look at the developments. I I look at what businesses are doing and I can't even keep up Mm. sometimes with everything that's happening because there's just so much happening Mm. every day. And so Saudi Green Initiative, the Saudi um, commitment to net zero by 2060, the public investment funds commitment to net zero by 2050. uh, So many businesses such as Aramco, Aquapower, Maadin announcing, you know, net zero commitments. These are the biggest emitters in the the country. Mm. I read somewhere yesterday that Aramco is now number two in the world in terms of size mm-hmm. um, it's it's just fascinating to see these mega players commit to net zero and and invest so much in technologies uh to to deal with with mm-hmm. that and that, what's what's actually to me even better is the impact that saudi is going to have on the world mm-hmm. because as all of these investments are being made in in the te- in technologies and in um, solutions to deal with climate change these are then going to be, you know, spread around, used by other people in other countries, especially developing countries, which will then get access to this, uh, not at the, at the premium. So mm-hmm. Saudi is pioneering that uh, work. And, and to me, it's fascinating mm-hmm. that uh, we've just got, come a long way from, you know, maybe um, not even talking, having these conversations about 10 years ago to to a place of commitment and and dedication to mm. not only dealing with the problem but leading yes. in in, solu- in creating solutions for the problem mm. so. and and you know we're, we're coming to the end of the episode but i'd love to know lastly is what do you think these visions and these commitments are doing for women in saudi in particular you know if you asked me 10 years ago um, if you told me that all these things that we're experiencing today in Saudi as women is going to happen, of course, driving the legal reforms, the family law reforms, all the different, all the opportunities that are now available to women in education and work and everything, I would honestly think that you were dreaming or mm-hmm. delusional. Mm-hmm. Like I would not have believed, not even in my wildest dreams. And I'm a dreamer. Mm-hmm. I believe that things could happen. What we are experiencing today as women in Saudi is just phenomenal. The amount of change, the positive energy, the support. um, Also, like just opening up opportunities for for women that are willing to to take those opportunities Mm -hmm. and, and really do something with them. And so I don't feel today at all that there's any difference between being a man or a woman in Saudi. If you work hard... If you are dedicated to doing, you know, the right thing and and succeeding, you will. Mm. There's um, no doubt in my mind today, and this is only something that I could have I could dream of mm. a few years ago. It was not even on my radar. <laughs> I actually said this in a previous interview. I always thought that I, I, I should just live somewhere else. I should. I, I couldn't be. I couldn't achieve my full potential in my own country. And it always made me sad because I had so much to offer, but I felt that my country had no place for me. Mm. And so that's gone today. Now, you know, if I get, I get offered to work in so many other places and I'm always, I say, no, I'm in Saudi by choice. I love it. 
it's the best place to be. I think that's the, probably the most beautiful way to end the episode because it's so full circle. Um, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you. I've enjoyed this conversation and I wish you all the best of luck in everything that Thank you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank I you. It as well. Thank you. Women in Leadership brought to you by Heron Code, the management consultancy for what happens next. For more information, you can visit heroncode.com.